Sí, cambió, ¿no? Vale, voy. Es que cuando mudes al micro, conmuta. Me está aquí. ¿Me oye? Sí, pero tiene un destino muteado, por eso. Hi, Steph. This is Pedro. Pedro. How are you? Good, good. Just sorry, I'm not there. It's uh, I suddenly as I sit there watching, it's like, oh, it's not the same. <laughs> so. oh. uh, there are some, because we have been there now uh, for lunch, so there will be a, a little delay. <laughs> no worries, no worries. It is like uh, uh, five minutes more, and um, they will connect. Okay, all right. I'll be here. <laughs> And then, uh, okay. Okay. Gracias. 
I am going to introduce you, and I hope I will not make any mistake. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> nice to meet you. Likewise, likewise. I was hoping to meet you in person, but uh, probably another time. <laughs> Hopefully another time, yes. <laughs> Okay. Um, I think I think uh, we are ready to move on to the next session of our colloquia, and uh, it is uh, an absolute pleasure uh, to welcome and introduce our next speaker, uh, who is uh, a brilliant and inspiring researcher, Dr. Stephanie Dudkiewicz. Uh, Stephanie is uh, a physicist. She did her undergraduate at the University of Miami, and then she pursued a PhD at the University of Rhode Island on Oceanography. Uh, she moved on uh, at MIT and she did a, a postdoc uh, there, and now she's uh, a principal scientist in MIT as well. So uh, Stephanie is fascinated by the bidirectional interplay between a marine ecosystem and uh, phytoplankton distribution and the physical and biogeochemical aspects uh, of the environment. 
Um, she has already uh, more than 10,000 citations and a plethora of uh, excellent publications uh, on different aspects of uh, plankton community structure, diversity, biogeography. Um, and she's critically interrogating the, the data of the ocean and uh, developing more modeling aspects uh, to try and predict the response of phytoplankton on uh, the future uh, the environment. So I would just like uh, very, very briefly to mention some of the publications that have caught my interest and apologies for this uh, biased uh, approach. Um, so uh, one of them is the impact of ocean acidification on the structure of future phytoplankton communities, which is published at Nature Climate uh, Change Journal. And basically they have assessed growth rates of phytoplankton at MBN and elevated PCO2 uh, conditions. Uh, one of my personal favorite ones that she has been a leading co-author, Why Marine Phytoplankton Calcify, where they have uh, assessed and uh, reviewed the reasons, the potential reasons and the cost and benefit aspect of calcification on coccolithophores. And uh, the future phytoplankton diversity in a changing climate, which is published at Nature Communications, and they use an ecosystem model with 35 different phytoplankton species to evaluate changes in uh, phytoplankton composition. Um, so today she will uh, enlighten us a little bit with uh, using models to help predict the future of the ocean ecosystem. So please welcome Stephanie with your warmest applause. And uh, Stephanie, <laughs> the, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for that, that introduction. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm going to touch on at least two of those papers you mentioned. So um, hopefully. Um, uh, uh, give it a, a, a feeling for some of the work I do. Um, anyway, so um, using models to help predict uh, the future of the um, ocean ecosystem. Um, and um, the bottom line is, is that um, we really don't understand the current oceans very well. Um, and so predicting what's happening in the future is quite difficult. Uh, so that probably will be the bottom line of the talk. Um, but on the sort of upside, um, at least we're beginning to understand what we need to learn more about um, in order to, to make these predictions. Um, so I'm going to start off, if I can figure out how to move my screen. Uh, my screen. There we go. Um, I'm going to start off kind of a, a broad picture of what, how our world is changing, narrow down to the oceans narrow down to sort of bulk properties like primary production, how that might be changing, and then get into the ecosystems themselves. Um, all of this from a sort of numerical modeling perspective. Um, so this is a, a, a movie that NASA has put together. It's showing the temperature, air temperature anomaly um, relative to 1951 to 1980. Um, and you can really see the variability. It changes from year to year. Um, uh, some places are warm, some places are cold. Um, but as we get into these later parts of the, 19th, uh, of the 1900s and into the 2000s, you can really see it's warm. We, we, we've changed our planet. Um, we're looking at temperatures of about one, at least one degree warmer than it was um, relative to this uh, anomaly. Um, so these, um, uh, and so if you look on the, uh, the graph on the right, and I'm hoping my mouse maybe is visible from this. If you just look at the black line, these are the observations of air temperature um, increases um, since the beginning of the century. Um, and so, as I said, you know, somewhere in the globally on the order of about a one degree change. And I think I, this probably is not an audience that I would need to suggest why it's happening. But on the right, this is um, total anthropogenic forcing. So it's greenhouse gases, it's CO2, um, it's methane, it's other gases that man um, has uh, released into the atmosphere, or at least man has caused to be released to the atmosphere. And you can see how it's been changing over the course of the century, um, sort of in uh, being a large cause of what's happening here. Um, so we know, we know we're making a change in the world. Um, and as we said, just do something. But we're, we're, um, we're maybe sadistic enough that we also want to know just how bad it could become. Um, and so um, we run models um, with sort of uh, predictions of how these emissions might change. Um, the pink line is pretty much if we do nothing, um, if we just keep emitting as if there was no tomorrow. Um, 
the bright red line is um, uh, what the Paris Agreement suggested we might try and do with about our mission. So it is, there is some big change. And the rest of these, I don't want you to fixate on them or even think too much about it, but it's different options of what we could do with our emissions. Um, we could make you know, huge uh, uh, strides to use renewable, finding new, new forms of energy, um, more energy efficiency. Um, and these are what those uh, would predict our air temperature might change over the course of the 20th century. Um, and so quite a range depending on what we, what we do. Um, for most of this talk, I'm going to be really looking at this pink line, um, just because we really want to push the system really hard to see how it is. But keep in mind that hopefully that's not where we're going. Um, if we do Paris as normal, um, it's not going to be quite as bad. And if we really, uh, you know, tighten our belts, think about it, change your world, um, we could get into one of these lines. But we're not doing these sort of predictions with a grass ball we use models. And so I want to take a little detour um, um, from, the, from the outline, just to talk about models a bit. Um, I was not sure entirely how diverse this audience is. Um, and so it's, it's worth just making sure we're all on the same playing field where we talk about what, what a model is. So I'm gonna be talking about mechanistic models and that is distinct from statistical models. Statistical models will find correlations between different um, uh, measurable things uh, to be able to make some predictions about, for instance, how uh, something might change. If one thing changes, like temperature, maybe we can say how something else will change, uh, like community uh, phytoplankton distributions. Um, instead, I'm going to use mechanistic models. So where we put in the best knowledge that we have of how a system works and um, see how that allows, and then step forward in time um, with those mechanistic understandings. So. For instance, in one of the, in this case, is if we went to one place in the ocean and we said, how is temperature going to change? It's going to be a combination of things. It's going to be how much heat is coming in from the surface, uh, how much um, is being cooler water is maybe being mixed from deep, how much that water parcel is going to be transported around. And so I like to think of it as, as this. We write down a set of equations. So um, here is now a set of equations governing how a fluid flows um, and how temperature might change. We make computer code out of it. We ask some computers to do some big work, stepping through those equations from time to time. So saying it, temperature is this at one time and all of these things happen at another time, it's going to be that, um, a different temperature. And then stepping it forward on like that. And you could step it forward from the pre-industrial all the way to the year 2100 and get, for instance, these sort of curves. Um, these sort of curves that were made with a specific type of model um, and that's called Earth system models. And an Earth system model one is one that incorporates different components of the, ocean, uh, of the, of the Earth. Um, so there are equations written for how the atmosphere circulation um, changes over time, how the chemistry of the atmosphere changes over time, the terrestrial component uh, will include how plants will grow, die, um, how they need water, um, uh, how they need nutrients, um, how water flows through the earth system. It has components to do with, well, many of them have components to do with ice showing, it's just not as entirely. And then there's an ocean component. So how temperature is changing, how circulation is changing, and then the component that we'll spend most of the time on, which is the ocean ecology and biogeochemistry. These sort of models are sold um, uh, on a grid. So the equations are worked out for each individual grid cell, and then the information is passed between grid cells. So rather than a crystal ball, we're using a model. It's better than a crystal ball, but there are a great deal of uncertainty, a lot of things that we still do not know about the Earth system in order to be able to do this um, so-called correctly. Um, and so there is, is a lot of work still uh, to be done in, in developing these models. Okay, so big picture Earth system models. Let's drill down a little bit into the ocean. How is the ocean going to change? And what do these models suggest about changes? So I'm going to show you some results um, from um, what's called the Coupled Model Intercomparison Project Phase 6. Uh, which means there's been five others before. 
These are models that are used in the IPCC reports. And so these are the, the from the latest, those, these ones were used in the latest reports. Um, in these, this particular set of um, results I'm going to be showing you, it's from 13 different Earth system models. Um, each of them have been run from pre industrial uh, to 2100 with various different scenarios. And again, I'm going to be really just talking about the, the worst case scenario, at least we hope it's the worst case scenario. Um, and here we're looking at sea surface temperature. Um, this is the historic sea surface temperature as an average over all of those 13 models. Um, so all the 13 models, sea surface temperature is average, and that's what we're looking at. On the right is how those models suggest sea surface temperature is going to be changed by the year, by the end of the century, so the last uh, two decades. Um, and it's kind of frightening. Um, we're talking three, four, five. Um, maybe even six degrees warmer. Um, uh, and that's mean. So that's what all the models, it, all the changes mean is uh, summed together, uh, uh, averaged together. The dots, so the stippling, um, suggests that the, the mean anomaly, as predicted by all the models, exceeds intermodal standard deviation. Um, in other words, saying the models are really quite consistent. They all agree that these regions. Um, the ones that are little black spots on, are really going to change in the sort of way that um, uh, uh, they all agree basically on how it will change. Um, so it's going to be warmer, um, but there are a lot of other things that happen because it's warmer. Um, sea ice melts. Um, the heat that goes into the, um, goes into the surface of the ocean and over a millennia, it'll get dispersed and moved down into the ocean, but it's a slow process. And so it's, oceans are going to become more stratified. There's going to be more heat at uh, the surface and therefore less communication between the surface and the deeper ocean. Um, it's also going to be altered circulation. So we're going to be changing both the, the vertical structure, but also the horizontal structure of the heat, uh, the, where the heat is distributed. And that's going to change um, the circulation of the ocean. Um, another uh, uh, problem is that, and problem or not problem, um, a lot of the CO2 that we have emitted has gone into the ocean. So that is maybe good because it offers, it means there's less greenhouse gases in the ocean, I mean, uh, in the atmosphere, but it's not a good thing for the ocean. Um, so when that CO2 goes into the ocean, um, it doesn't stay mostly as CO2. In fact, it, most of it goes into bicarbonate. And bicarbonate, um, when it uh, dissociates this way, produces um, hydrogen um, um, atom, ion. Um, and the pH is a, a logarithmic function of that, a, of that H plus. And so as we put more and more carbon into the ocean, the pH is going to change. So here again um, is an average of the 13 different Earth system models and what they predict uh, the historic so the current day pH is being so slightly alkaline. And you can see that they all very clearly agree that we're going to decrease um, the pH in the ocean. So we're going to go towards a more acidic ocean, more carbon dioxide in the ocean as well, but more acidity. Um, and it's quite a large change. Um, my understanding, I'm not in the medical profession, but I had a doctor tell me, to tell me that um, a change of that, uh, of that sort of alkalinity in, in our bodies would mean we'd basically die. Um, so uh, that's a problem for organisms that live in a, in a fluid that is going to be changing um, dramatically. So really what I'm supposed to be speaking about, and now that I've taken that long preamble, is um, what are the consequences of these sort of changes for marine product productivity and ecosystems? And I'm really gonna focus on the plankton, in fact, pretty much the phytoplankton, I'm gonna to touch a little bit on the zooplankton, um, but really not address the fact that they're feeding this, um, the rest of the marine ecosystem. And I believe you have a talk later in the week that might uh, address this more, more fully. Um, but keep in mind, and in fact, I will keep saying it, what happening to the zooplankton, the phytoplankton is going to affect higher trophic levels uh, because it's all interconnected. All right, okay, so I'm going to start on the bulk scale, saying what's going to happen to my marine productivity? So the, the ability of, of marine, the marine ecosystems to take in carbon and produce oxygen. 
But let's uh, take another little detour and make sure that we sort of know what sort of model, how these models might work. Um, so again, a mechanistic model, we're putting in the best knowledge of a system that we have um, and then seeing how it changes over time. So in this case, let's think about the change in phytoplankton biomass. It's going to be uh, a combination of how it grows and that's going to be determined by how many nutrients there are, the light, the temperature, um, possibly other factors. Um, the losses are going to be determined by um, things like grazing, viruses, cell death. And then all of this is going to be within a moving ocean. So these phytoplankton biomass is going to be moved around and mixed um, by the water. Um, and such as phytoplankton, we, they're not in a, in a vacuum. We need to think about what feeds them. And so we need equations for how nutrients are being uptaken. Um, we need equations uh, for how the zooplankton are eating those phytoplankton. Uh, we need to know the equations for how these um, uh, organic matter that is, is dead um, may be remineralized back to nutrients. Um, again, we should also probably have what's happening to the zooplankton, so the higher trophic levels, and in some ways we make closure terms for that. Um, but the models I'm going to be talking about are pretty much what these call the MPZD models. So the, the, the cycling from inorganic to organic um, and back. Um, so we write a set of equations. We make, put it into computer code and we ask computers to do all the work. And then we get some, some sort of four-dimensional um, uh, idea of what's happening to the ocean uh, phytoplankton, zooplankton, detritus, uh, nutrients. Um, and I'll get sort of a little more into that. Um, by the way, there was a really nice um, primer on ocean biogeochemical model that came out, I think, just a few days ago in Nature Reviews. Um, so if you're interested to learn more about um, ocean models, um, uh, it is a really good resource. Okay, so let's go back to those 13 different models um, from a, a system model. So each of those 13 models have a different but um, similar um, uh, ecosystem model embedded in, so these um, uh, MPZD type models. And this uh, is the mean over all of those models of the net primary production. So the amount of carbon that is being fixed by the phytoplankton. And you can see um, sort of classic uh, features that we expect of the ocean, these tropical gyres, higher productivity in these upwelling regions. And what do they suggest for the future? Okay, so the purple means that they predict a decrease in net primary production. The green um, means there is an increase in primary production. Um, and again, this is the mean. So it's taking all those 13 models, what they predict as the change and making a mean of that. And the stippling here, and here is the sort of frightening piece of it, the stippling here means 80% of the models agree on the sign. So not the magnitude, just the sign. And you can see how small that is, how few places it really agree on what might be happening. Um, just as a note, this is, this is CMIP 6. CMIP 5, actually, the models agreed more than they do now. So in fact, we're, we're, we're getting worse, if we might say it that way. Um, but I think um, maybe just to reiterate, it maybe no, means that we're learning more about what we don't know um, and you know, what, how, how these models need to um, uh, parameterize things differently. Um, but uh, as a sort of part of, of this talk, I thought we'd let's still delve a little bit into this. So why is it so difficult to predict what's going to happen to marine productivity? Well, let's remember that there are many things that are happening. We've already went through. It's warming, there's becoming less ice, it's becoming more stratified, there's alterations to circulation, and there's um, changes to the, to the um, amount of carbon in the ocean. Um, so let's step through each of these and how I might affect uh, uh, an ecosystem. So phytoplankton, um, and so this is the specific growth rate of phytoplankton as a function of temperature. Um, each of these black lines represents a single species and how it has a thermal um, norm. So it, it has a, a range of temperatures it grows over um, and sort of place where it's maximum, and then it drops up quite sharply um, for warmer temperatures. Um, but what is kind of noticeable from this is that warmer adapted species growth have a maximum growth rate that is faster than um, uh, 
colder adapted species. And so if we go to a warmer world, we're going to, as we go to select for warmer species, we're going to have faster rates, so faster growth rates, um, if that was all that's happening. So all of these um, uh, species, these experiments that were done were done with sort of the, the right light and the right um, multi, um, full nutrients. Um, so um, uh, just to keep that part in mind, there's some pieces on top of that. So there's going to be less sea ice and the ocean's going to be more stratified. So that's really going to alter the light environment that the phytoplankton see. And they're going to see more probably because of the uh, lack of sea light. And going to be stratification is going to hold them closer to the surface. So in, in, in a higher light environment. Um, the increase in stratification and these alterations in circulation are going to alter the amount of nutrients that make it to the surface in general. That's going to reduce the amount of nutrients coming to the circle because it's this less connection between the, the surface and down. And the sort of the main reservoir of, of nutrients, in this case, this is nitrate, are down deep in the ocean. Um, these are also going to change which type, which nutrients are, are limiting. Um, so um, uh, some places may have been limited by uh, iron before, but now they may become limited by nitrate because nitrate is not coming to the surface in the same level. And so that's alteration of patterns of, of where different nutrients are limiting. Um, the change in the pH is also uh, likely to change uh, growth rates, calcification rates, all sorts of um, uh, rates within the ocean. Um, this is from um, actually the paper that, that was just mentioned, um, where we, uh, the, the, each of these symbols here is an experiment where someone has taken a particular species, they've grown it in current day um, uh, pH, and then, well, not so much pH, but the, the amount of carbon, uh, CO2 in the water. Um, and they've grown it at one uh, with sort of ambient CO2, and then in another case where we, they put in higher CO2, and then compare those growth rates. And so if it's one, it means they grow the same. Um, but if it's higher than one, it means they grow faster in when there's elevated uh, uh, CO2. And they can see that there's a very wide range, and we'll, we'll come back to that. But uh, one of the takeaways from that is that the majority uh, of the the mean across all of these species is actually to a higher growth rate. Um, but more importantly, it's all over the place. Um, so let's um, so let's think about what these will these sort of uh, changes might uh, um, how it will impact productivity in the ocean. So I have a model, um, and I I can tweak it in different ways, and I can artificially tweak it so that the only thing the phytoplankton see is the decrease in nutrients. It, I can, over the course of the century, I hold the temperature the same as it would be pre-industrial. Um, I do that artificially, but it's to make, to make a point. Um, so I've run the model um, for actually from 1860, and here I'm just showing from 2000 to 2100, and I'm showing the change in the global productivity. So um, sort of integrating across the entire globe, well, how is the productivity changing? And you can see that it is decreasing, and this is a percentage, so a 15% decrease in productivity of the ocean. Quite dramatic. Um, on the other hand, because it's a model, I can force it to still have this over the course of the century to still have the same nutrient supply as it was as if it was pre-industrial, but only allow the phytoplankton to see what would happen if, if the um, uh, temperatures changed. So I can allow those growth rates to increase, but keep the same amount of nutrients coming into the system. And we can see an increase in uh, productivity just because things are, are turning over quicker. Um, on the other hand, if I put in the fact that in general, the, um, there is an increase in um, rates with higher uh, CO2 in the water, um, that's those blue lines here, um, uh, the light blue lines, um, maybe there'll be a slight increase. And so this total, so when you run it with all of these three different stresses at the same time, can be, well, it could be positive, it could be negative. You can see that's quite, quite, it all depends on just how each of these um, different stresses is actually affecting um, the system. Um, so uh, all of these changes uh, 
happen almost independent, well, have, have independent uh, uh, ways it affects the phytoplankton. Plus there's a lot of uncertainties on impact and then the feedback from um, higher trophic levels. How do things go up to the next tro trophic level um, in each of these cases, there's reduced nutrients if there's reduced grazing. Um, quite complex. And part of the reason, therefore, why we are seeing very different uh, results from different uh, uh, models. Um, different models have different physics. They're going to have different amount of nutrients that are coming to the surface. Uh, that the changes in the amount of nutrients that are coming to the surface will be different between different models. Um, the amount that the temperatures might change in small pockets might change might be different. Um, and but more importantly, and, and if I have time, I'll come back to it. It also depends how all of these models parameterize things like how growth rates get faster with warmer temperatures. Um, as I said, each of these have very similarly structured models, but the parameter, the actual numbers, the parameters themselves might be quite different. So um, uh, the take home, um, most models in uh, predict an increase in the subtropical gyres. So because there's less nutrients, and you can see this in the pink here, um, that the edges of the gyres are growing outwards, and so you're getting larger gyre, larger regions which have very low nutrients. Um, most of the models predict that these, these negative parts are, are um, they're more and stronger negative parts than they are these positive regions, and so the net primary production will go down, at least in these very high um, uh, emission scenarios. But they also do predict that there'll be an increase in productivity in regions where ice, melt, ice melts and in some of these higher nutrient regions, um, for instance, along the edge of the um, Southern Ocean. But reminding there's a lot of uncertainty and how these different stresses act together. And more importantly, um, none of these models um, so none of these 13 models, and as far as I know, no, not many of the, none of the other uh, system models out there, but I say, I say most rather than all because there might be, none of them take into change the change in ocean acidification. What these ones are looking at is changes in temperature, changes in nutrient supply, changes in how the ice melts, but they do not include um, ocean acidification. And as we've sort of shown in these, in these um, experiments I did here, um, they could be, it could be quite an important part of the stresses. Um, so uh, that would make these, these uh, predictions possibly even uh, more di um, divergent if everyone put in their own idea about how ocean acidification would change um, productivity. Okay, so uh, let's get down to the, the lowest level, which is how marine ecosystems might change. And um, you might say, if we are so bad at doing productivity, why even bother with trying to understand how the ecosystems are changing? Well, I would say that in fact, it's, it's the other way around. We would need to understand on the ecosystem level how things might be changing so that we can be at better at change at looking at how marine productivity changes. And why is that? Well, because phytoplankton are really quite diverse. When we talk about a broad, broad product like primary production, um, it's the sum of what a lot of different species are doing. And these phytoplankton range in, in size, uh, several orders of magnitude, I think it's about eight or nine orders of magnitude each in, between the smallest and the largest. They change difference in shapes, they're different in functions, some fix, uh, um, fix nitrogen, some make glass shells, um, some calcify. Um, uh, so again, getting back to one of the other papers that discussed, um, um, introduced us. Um, and then since, oh, sorry, the wrong way around. Oh, um, and then the important piece is that all of these stresses are gonna affect different species differently. And so that's gonna make it really complicated. Um, so let's try and unpack some of these a little in a little bit. So it seems absolutely, I've, I've shown this, this mandala before, but it seems like the most appropriate time I've ever shown it um, at the symposium. Um, and that it's well known that different phytoplankton um, are better adapted at different environments, um, as very nicely shown um, and described by Margalaf. Um, uh, and this, this is a, a slight updated of his mandala uh, to include some of the species that he might not even have known existed um, when he made uh, his, this map. 
But the idea is that some are really well adapted to high nutrients, in this case, and high turbulent waters, such as diatoms, and others. And, and I'm going to talk more about Prochorococcus, which is the smallest phytoplankton. Actually, I didn't make it as small as it is. Anyway, it's the, it's the smallest phytoplankton out there. Um, it's well adapted to very stratified waters where there's very low nutrients and it does much better. But there's a whole stream in between um, and going along this um, um, K versus R strategy uh, uh, axis. Um, and this is actually something that I took from one of Pedro's papers. Um, but we can think of um, R specialists, so the ones that are on this top part of this, this uh, mandala, as being um, uh, grow fast, but they need lots of nutrients. So they're well adapted to when there's lots of nutrients and lots of things being brought to the surface of the ocean. Whereas the K specialist, um, the, so this dotted line here, this particular species, does much better um, at low nutrients, um, but doesn't grow as fast at high nutrients. Um, and so this separation. Um, so this is, is, well, I would say it's two axes on this one, but there are actually multiple axes that you could add to this uh, temperature. Um, uh, maybe how pH changes could be another, um, how light changes. So there's um, a whole number of axes you could add to make this a much more uh, multidimensional uh, mandala. And so, um, but the, the sort of dichotomy between this K and the R strategist is something that is, is, is well understood and is something that all of these Earth system models, I'm actually going back to the CMIP-5 models, but I think most CMIP-6 models have very similar structures. They try at least contain the, that, the, that level of, of diversity within the model. So a fast growing diatom, sorry, this I should, each of these is, is, one, is a different um, Earth system model. Um, and this is the number of phytoplankton it ha ha type it includes. So that MPCD um, type model will have two, two Ps. So two phytoplankton. Um, and in here, this is the number of zooplankton they have. Anyway, all of the models have at least two, um, a, a small, slow-growing case strategist and a fast-growing, larger um, R strategist. And they may include um, some other uh, types as well, but the uh, level of complexity is quite low. And when you run models such as this, you can come up with um, uh, biomass that looks like this. So the top here is, is some small case strategist. I'm showing here Prochorococcus um, as, as an example. And the, they dominate the, the lower latitudes, um, the more stratified waters, um, and the diatoms being more um, the high, um, high latitude, high nutrient regions. And then this is what uh, uh, would su suggest as a change in the biomass between um, current day and the, and the future. Um, so where it's negative, it means it's decreasing in the future. And there's two things that almost all of these models suggest. One, this again, this increase in the subtropical gyre, which means an expansion um, of the region where these small phytoplankton dominate. So you can see that in the red for this, this small phytoplankton at the top. So it decreases with lower nutrients in the, um, in, in the gyres, uh, but it, increases, it has an increase in its range. It suggests for the larger phytoplankton that there also is a decrease, um, but the range increases because it goes into regions where there was sea ice and there was, so there is the red you can see here. But more importantly, the, the blue, um, this is in percentage, the smaller phytoplankton decrease less than the larger phytoplankton group. So they both go down in many regions, but they go down, the larger phytoplankton are more um, effective because of these lower nutrients. And this has been seen in a number of studies, um, which I list here. But what happens if we try and, and think about a much more diverse community? Um, so we don't just have two phytoplankton, we have this whole range of different strategies. So I'm gonna show some results um, from a slightly more complicated um, model. Um, so where we do have size, so each of the rows here depicts a different size in terms of the equivalent spherical diameter. So going from about uh, 0.4 micron um, cell to um, phytoplankton cells um, on the region of about 100 microns. 
um, uh, on the right is the zooplankton, and you can see that they have um, um, have they, they go up to about um, over a thousand uh, microns in size. There are different uh, functional types, so we still have this idea of the small things, so these the prokaryotes and these prokaryotes, but we include different functional groups such as coccolithophores, diazotrophs, nitrogen fixing organisms, these diatoms, as well as some mixotrophs. The arrows here. Um, depict uh, who eats who. So you can see it's quite a complex uh, food web, um, including sort of carnivory, so zooplankton and other zooplankton. And there's a number of uh, uh, publications where we've used this model or just slight variations of this model um, uh, to explore um, a number of um, uh, uh, Consequent uh, uh, controls on community structure and how things might change in the future. Um, I also want to point out that this is a trait based model. So instead of trying to decide what the parameters are for each individual um, uh, cell or, or type of phytoplankton, um, most of the growth and the grazing um, parameterizations are set elementary. So, depending, um, assuming that things like growth rate, um, how saturations, um, even the grazing has some uh, links to size. Um, and so we can actually have this very complex model, but without as many, um, without individually um, parameterizing each growth rate. Um, okay, so we can slice and dice this model in various ways. So we can add up um, the biomass. So first of all, we run this model in a full three dimensions with uh, multiple nutrients, so uh, iron, nitrate, phosphate, silica. Um, and here I'm showing sort of present day um, uh, results of, of biomass in the top 50 meters. Um, and what I've done is I've added all the diatoms together to give this um, silicifier a biomass. And I'm comparing um, to data, a data synthesis of observations of these different functional groups. Um, uh, down here, this bottom row. We can see sort of a more ubiquitousness of these picoplankton, smallest phytoplankton types, um, and these more distinct patterns of the ones that require different nutrient, uh, have different nutrient um, uh, requirements. Uh, so the silicifiers are limited by the amount where um, there is silica in the ocean. Um, the nitrogen fixes, um, which have given actually a slower growth rate to account for the fact that they have energetic costs of ni fixing nitrogen, um, are much more reduced in where they can um, e exist. Um, and if we do that, we can get a, a model that has actual community structure. Um, so this is um, a higher resolution version of the model. So it's, it's a model that's run on, on um, most of what I'm mean showing you is one degree or two degree resolution in the model in the vertical. This one's a much higher resolution and I'm showing it because it's just much more beautiful. Um, this, uh, uh, this the simulation was run and, and this beautiful movie made by my colleague Oliver Yan. The different colors are showing different combinations of phytoplankton. So where it's yellow, the community is dominated by diatoms. Where it's white, it means a relatively even community with lots of different phytoplankton coexisting. Um, and so we can see the broad scale patterns that we're, we're going to delve more into. Um, but it's really fun to see the, the smaller scale patterns um, that I'm, I'm sure you heard from Marina's talk earlier, how these, these small scale features can really alter and change um, really impact the communities um, by providing very different um, niches. Um, and I'll just I'll leave that to see, because it's really fun during the spring blooms to see these very different little sets of communities pop up. Um, anyway, so we have a model which is quite complex, has these quite complex community structures that will change over time. Um, and we're now going to ask how do they, might these change in the future? So on the top row is what we've seen already, the biomass of these different phytoplankton types, um, where I've averaged um, uh, over functional groups. This is the biomass of those groups in um, 2100. And below, I'm showing the percentage change. So where it is the sort of brightest red color, it means that um, the range has increased. And so in particular, if we look at these diazotrophs, you can see that their range has uh, um, 
expanded in the future world, though their biomass where they were originally has gone down. Um, this expansion is due to change of, of which limit of the uh, degree to which different nutrients are limiting um, the system. Um, and I could spend a whole uh, seminar about that, but if you're interested there, we have a paper on that. But you can see that each of these uh, different groups is changing in some different way. And the patterns are not all the same. Um, and so uh, we could delve into that more, but I think the real thing to take home is that different groups respond differently. Um, some increase their domain, some decrease their domain, and the regional patterns are different. What that means is, is that there's going to be different communities, different combinations of, of phytoplankton in different places. And um, I didn't add it, but I think in all the rest of my take homes, it says this is important for upper trophic levels. So this is important for upper trophic levels. Um, we can sort of try and get an idea of how the full com the, the community itself, and then here I'm talking about the community as in um, different functional groups, how they um, might alter in the in the future. Um, uh, and I'm using the Bray Curtis Dissimilarity Index. So this is now looking at the community at each location in the year uh, 2000, or actually the decade around 2000, and then the decade around 20, uh, 2100, and seeing how different they are by looking from uh, the biomass within each of these functional groups. Um, this is the uh, equation here, but the important part is if it's zero, the community stays the same. In 2100 and 2000, they're about similar. Where they're one, it means it's a completely different community. That means that it's completely shifted to a whole new set of communities. Um, and that happens um, in these sea ice regions, sea ice um, it's retreats. Um, but the rest of the ocean um, changes, and it changes quite a lot. I mean, it, you may be thinking, oh, that's just the light, light yellow, that's fairly low, but that's at least 20% of the, the functional groups so, you know, diatoms might have completely disappeared and been replaced by picoplankton. And again, as, of, as I mentioned, um, that is going to have major effects on, trop and trophic, um, on the higher trophic levels. So it's at least 20% in all parts of the ocean. We can slice this model in a different way. Instead of looking at the different um, functional groups, we could look at different size classes. Um, so these are the size classes that are quite often used um, when describing um, ocean communities that picoplankton, less than two microns, the nano that are two to 20 microns, and larger things here. In the model, this is um, what the biomass of those different types are in the current day. Um, and then this is uh, what the model uh, predicts the changes um, in the future. Um, so um, again, complex patterns, mostly decreases um, in the uh, lower latitudes and some increases in the higher latitudes. But in general, we can try and sort of uh, average all of those, that sort of pattern into um, how biomass is spread over different size classes. And so I'm actually now talking about all the, I have 16 different size classes. So how the biomass is distributed over 16 different size classes. And in general, that there is more small things and less large things. And we can produce a slope of that um, so this might be the slope at some location in the year 2000 um, of how the biomass is distributed along those. And then this is some work that um, Stephanie Henson um, led um, using this model, looking at how that slope changed. So if the slope is, is one way, um, if it decreases, it means it becomes, uh, it tilts more uh, to the right. So, so sorry. I'll see if you can see me, but um, anyway, the slope it suggests that the, um, where it's negative, it suggests the slope um, is, is shifting more this way. So more, relatively more in the large size classes than in the small size classes. And that happens in most parts of the ocean. Um, there's definitely some places where it goes up and, and I could get into the long, complicated reason about each of those, but um, overall um, the, it decreases. Um, but it doesn't necessarily decrease because everything decreases. So as in this bottom line, um, the slope changes, but everything decreases. It could be that the biomass stays exactly the same. It's just now that it's made up of small things, more small things and less large things. Um, or it could be that everything goes up, but it, the small things go up more. And you can see these patterns if you're looking uh, carefully here, you can see um, in these lower latitudes, the large things go down more than the small things. Um, but in like the Southern Ocean here, 
um, there's some increases in all phytoplankton sizes, but the large ones even more so, um, and so really changing these um, patterns. So this goes back to what um, has really been seen before, that the smaller things are, um, uh, are um, relatively less uh, impacted, um, but I think quite a bit more nuanced, that it's not just um, the, the fact that there's in between size classes allows much more nuanced um, patterns of these slope changes. And slope changes are a consequence to the higher trophic levels. We can also try and look at uh, levels of um, understanding how communities change over the entire, uh, um, instead of just looking in side classes or in um, functional groups. Um, and again, this is work um, that Stephanie led. Um, this is looking at turnover. So it's the number at any um, location. Um, it's the number of species that were lost or gained. Um, and this is uh, between the beginning of the end of the century. So how many species are lost or gained by the end of the century relative to the total number of, of species or types of phytoplankton that were there. And it's uh, you know, quite a complicated pattern, but it's showing that everywhere there's been some shift. So there's number, there, there hasn't been any place that has completely, well, almost no places that have been completely stayed with just the same species as before. But possibly more interesting than this is how that turnover changes over the course of the century. So you can look at the turnover, say, between one decade, in the 20s to the 30s, and then how the 30s to the 40s, and the 40s to the 50s, and how, how quickly is that turnover changing? And that's what's showing here. And this is the turnover rate. Um, so where it's positive, it means it's getting faster and faster how quickly this turnover is happening. And so that means by the year of 20, 2100, a new community is coming in quicker and quicker than, than um, earlier on. And so these, um, uh, these community structures are becoming more ephemeral. They're coming in, going out. Um, we can also look at um, their um, evenness. So how evenly are these uh, the species distributed? Um, and this is the change in the evenness. Um, so negative meaning they're becoming less even, meaning some species, uh, some types of phytoplankton are becoming dominating the biomass more and more. So the take home, um, we have the future uh, is likely to have less even communities and the, the community structure is going to change faster and faster as we go towards the end of the century um, with consequences for higher trophic levels. Um, I suddenly realized that I thought I was going really too fast and in fact, I'm almost out. Um, so um, let's whiz through this quickly. Um, almost all studies have only contemplated how um, communities uh, change because of temperature changes, nutrient changes, sea ice changes. Um, but as we discussed earlier, the um, different phytoplankton can have very different responses to um, uh, how, um, uh, CO2 is um, uh, changing. Um, and we're going to fo focus here on these two species, Procrococcus and Cynococcus. Um, there are not many experiments, but the ones that do suggest that Procrococcus really doesn't mind if, if, the, um, if there's more CO2 in water, it's stayed pretty much the same, but Cynococcus has a benefit. Um, and so if we run a model, and it's going to be a slightly different version of the model, but where we um, allow these CO2 changes to come in uh, to play out, uh, with the synecoccus having a little tiny bit more of a benefit, so we're not talking much of a change in growth rate, about a 10% change in its growth rate, and Procrococcus having no change in its growth rate because of the CO2, you can see quite a dramatic um, pattern change. Um, Procrococcus gets outcompeted by what used to be a, a, a lesser competitor um, by the year 2100. So, sorry, this is biomass in the year 2000 and biomass in the 2100. Okay, so um, how about trophic levels? I don't have much time, but I also don't have a lot to say because until we really get some better handle on what's happening at the lower trophic levels, it's, it is difficult to um, make predictions. But in general, um, the model that I've been showing you, but others also suggest there's going to be an amplification. So um, the grazes um, are going to be, so this is uh, uh, autotroph biomass in current day, uh, grazer biomass in the current day, 
and then on the right, the, the difference um, by the year 2100. And you can see that, that the predictions of lower biomass um, in the low latitudes for the autotrophs is amplified in the grazers. Um, uh, some interesting, um, and if you, um, the Schuss paper is, is uh, well worth reading if you're interested in it, but this interesting combinations, it's like because the nutrients go down, there's less phytoplankton, makes less uh, grazers, um, because there's very, we're in a, in a system where we're really um, very low biomass um, and, and it's a sort of saturating function, um, it affects the grazers more. But in some regions, the increased graze, it, where there's increase in grazers, that means there's more uh, grazing pressure and so you actually get lower autotrophs. Um, and so there's interesting combinations there. Um, all of, uh, most of these models have really um, not thought about the fact that a species would evolve. Um, and so there is definitely some uh, uh, avenue for study on how evolution, adaptation and evolution are impacted. Um, this is just to suggest um, that there will be new niches. We're going to have places in the, in the, in the ocean where um, temperatures or pH or um, uh, nutrient uh, environment are going to be completely different to anything that has been seen um, up to this day. And so species will need to adapt. Some species will need to evolve to be able to fill those niches. So here the example is this phytoplankton X, which has a thermal norm like this, oops, sorry, this pink line, um, which lived in the sort of warmest part of the ocean um, in the present day. It's going to get pushed out as, as the um, world warms. And this, this water becomes too warm for it. Um, either it has to evolve or another species will need to evolve um, to be able to fill that niche. And this species Y, for instance, fills this, this niche. Um, I'm going to skip um, to um, my final slides. Um, sorry, I had not realized it went on for the time. Um, so, yes, what's the future going to be? Um, so uh, just summaries, um, and I, I will make these slides available because I'm afraid I'm going to zip through this um, very quickly, but multiple stresses, each of them affecting the ecosystems in a different way. And so how they all interact and add up to each other are difficult. Um, uh, multiple things will be happening on the ecosystem level, um, which we can go through. Um, but I would like to just sort of end with um, uh, we're, we're better than a crystal ball, but the science um, is, is not all in. We, we still need to learn a lot about our, our system in order to be able to make predictions. Um, and rather than taking that as, as a negative, um, and I had a couple of slides that I'm just going to allude to and you can scroll through them. Um, it really depends how we, met, how we do our parameterization. So we need to learn more about, for instance, how growth rates affect um, the phytoplankton. Um, growth rates, this is growth rates, temperature, um, sort of old school, but now we know that different types of phytoplankton grow different, um, have different responses. And there's a couple more things in here, but um, I think I want to end with that. And um, if I have time for questions, if not, I can answer those in the discussion. But thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Stephanie. That was really nice and engaging talk. Thank you. And it is always a pleasure to see how the blending between present notion about geochemistry and modeling can tell us about the future. Um, do we have any questions for Stephanie? Yeah. Th thank you, Stephanie. Very interesting. And um, my question is regarding the prediction of uh, primary productivity in the future. And does uh, the model take in, into account also the deep uh, photic zone productivity? Because we know that uh, there are a lot of biomass there, especially in the subtropical gyre. And I was wondering if the, the observation of uh, the model are built by a satellite observation. Maybe uh, there, is, there is the possibility to, be, to have a bias because of uh, the satellite can scan only the first part of the water. So what's... Uh, uh, so the answer is yes, they do take it into account. These are our mechanistic models, so um, that work um, uh, not only horizontally but with depth. 
Um, and so the models will capture a deep chlorophyll maximum. Um, and um, wh where there is increased productivity at the deep chlorophyll maximum, they'll capture that too. Um, in a lot of these models, as you become more stratified, that deep chlorophyll maximum might be raised up. And so it might actually see more sunlight. Um, and so the productivity numbers that were given are, are depth integrated. Um, and so they will capture them. Um, but the caveat being, um, do we capture it correctly? Uh, are we parameterizing how um, that deep chlorophyll maximum is, is productive? Um, are we parameterizing how light penetrates through the ocean correctly? Um, a, a lot of these models use very uh, simplistic um, a penetration of light, um, don't take into account that it's spectrally resolved. Um, so yes, they do include it, but it's, it'll be relatively crude. Thank you. Any other question? Don't be shy. <laughs> no, uh, in the last uh, slide, you show how the growth rates of different species uh, increase with temperature, especially diatom. It seems that increase a lot, but I'm wondering if these experiments have been done in different nutrient conditions, and then maybe diatoms are not so. Uh, could grow in, if, in nutrient limitation, even if the temperature increases? Um, I, I, the trouble with doing things at home is that my neighbors have decided to cut their lawn right now. So I only, I only got, um, I, and so um, I'm, I'm gonna answer a little bit, but um, I think you may have to just say again what, um, uh, so oops, sorry, I was sorry. Um, so to explain this slide a little more thoroughly, um, so this is a different, um, and on the right is, is the typical epilic curve where we have these, um, each dot is an experiment where people have grown things, we, we think to the where maximum growth rate. Um, and we can see that this is um, uh, increase um, over, over the things, and we call it a Q10. Um, so how much uh, that increase in growth rate will be over 10 degrees centigrade out of temperature. Um, so the work I'm showing here um, uh, is, is by a paper by Stephanie Anderson that came out last year, where she then separated, she took a lot more experiments because there've been a lot more experiments since, uh, since then, um, since the 70s. Um, and then, but she separated it into different functional types and then came up with Q10s for each of them. And the blue one here is the diatom. Um, the dotted line is, is the epi curve, so the same curve is here. And it suggests that actually diatoms have a slightly uh, lower um, Q10 than epi. Um, and sorry, I, I got that there was something about diatoms going maybe slower, so I don't know if that maybe answers. Um, but while I'm on this figure, it shows, for instance, that cyanobacteria might um, increase, their, their Q10 might be higher um, than other species. Um, so apologies, I, 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 I'm still mowing outside, but if, if that didn't answer, could you, could you repeat the last part of your question? I was wondering the combination of temperature and nutrients, maybe with uh, different nutrient conditions, this, um, the temperature uh, response was, will be different and, and it will not be the same uh, I mean, the same for the different species. I mean, the interactions between temperature and nutrient will not affect the same in the same, uh, for different species. This was my Ex question. Yeah, no, an excellent, excellent question. Yes, um, when we um, uh, when we talk about how we parameterize things, um, uh, in the models, we quite often do these things separately. Yeah, you grow like this from temperature, and we just, it's a multiplicative effect with how you do it with nutrients. Um, but these, as you said, these cross combinations. So if you've got low temperatures and high nutrients or low nutrients, you might respond differently um, and not in that way. And um, I think that is one of the things going forward that we need much more information about. Um, people doing these cross, uh, cross, cross stressor um, experiments. Um, so I know that uh, there has been some talk about doing these sort of experiments where you do lots of different temperatures and lots of different nutrients and then sort of see where that, that landscape of, of happens. And yes, it is it is likely to be quite uh, quite different and something that we need to put in the model. So um, I think that's more of a, just an agreement with your statement rather than that um, 
And the models do not capture that. And they don't capture that because we don't know what it is and it requires um, more experimentation um, to see how that landscape um, of multiple stresses is happening at the same time. Um, so excellent question, thank you. So one of those things I had wanted to end up on all these things we need and, and one of those being those sort of multivectorial uh, experiments. So thank you. Thank you. Do we have another question? I also have one. Um, hello, thank you for the nice talk. I was wondering whether there's, so it's a model and uh, I was wondering whether the confidence uh, in the model could change over time and does it lose predictive power at one moment? Or not really? <laughs> Interesting question. Um, the fact that uh, 13 different models can't agree on the sign of uh, the change by 2100 suggests some level um, um, of uh, difficulty in predictive power. Um, uh, certainly, as you go towards the end of the century, there are going to be more and more niches that are new and different. And so we would not believe it as much in the year 2100 as we might maybe in the year 2030. Um, but I would say that these models are still far from being a decent representation of the current ocean. So um, hmm, how do I put this? I, I think it means you have to be careful in what you interpret. Um, so for instance, I showed you um, an example where Procarpopus dies in the, by the year 2100 um, because um, it gets outcompeted by something that has an, in, an increase in uh, abilities of high CO2. Do I think that Procarpopus is going to die by the year 2100? No. What I want to take away from the model, though, is that it is small changes in fitness that are going to affect community structure. So I think, and maybe this is sort of going around your question a bit, is that we shouldn't, the predictions themselves are not individual species levels, but rather the, the, the mechanisms, the controlling mechanisms that we are looking at. And so changes in fitness, understanding that it's small change in fitness is going to have a really big impact in community. That's what I think it's worth taking away rather than I'm predicting that Procarpopus is going to die out. And those sort of uh, uh, understanding of, the, of some of the fundamentals, I think, doesn't necessarily change as you go over the course of the 21st century. Um, I don't know if that actually made sense, but, but I, I guess... Um, in the end, uh, many of these models don't have strong predictive power of specifics. What they have, some level of predictive power, is what might matter. And I, I don't know if that answers your question. Um, yeah, yeah, in a way. And I guess a sub-question, I think you sort of replied to uh, Celia that indeed uh, integrating more uh, combined effect of temperature and growth, uh, nutrients on growth rate relevant. And so... What would you need from in situ researchers to sort of improve your computations? And do you need actually something or <laughs> not really? I don't know. Um, yes, although, it, um, you know, it's up high in the sky at some level. Um, so, yes, these sort of factorial studies where change multiple stresses, and it's not just the, the nutrients and the temperature, it's also the, um, the pH, um, you know, uh, light levels, you know, it's, it's not just a two. A two uh, two axes, it's multiple axes. Um, I think experiments like that are really um, are really important. Um, but also um, it is and what makes it difficult to answer on that because I'd love to yeah go go do those experiments. But it depends what species you go and do it with. Um, and, and again, this in this study here, these are, are all different experiments where someone spent you know maybe their PhD doing getting to this spot here. But, and that's this particular diatom responds really well to PC increase, but this particular species doesn't. And so I could say, yeah, go find your favorite organism and do this multiple set, but that's not gonna really necessarily help the model because that's not representative of all diatoms. There are other diatoms that go this way. So I think the experiments themselves are gonna be really important, but I think the fundamental um, we need on a cellular level to understand why one goes 
improves and one doesn't, so that we can understand more the physiology of what allows one to respond better and what doesn't, um, so that we can then expand to a whole community, knowing that that level at the, at the sort of, uh, um, you know, enzymatic level, I guess, of how these people, these respond. Um, so that's not a necessarily an encouraging thing. It's like, I can't, I can't suggest, that, you know, go and do like a thousand different experiments to find this. I think we need, we need more fundamental cellular level knowledge about how things um, um, might respond in the future. Um, but that said, uh, 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 monitoring, uh, long-term monitoring, I think will be really crucial. Um, because that also can help us understand uh, um, mechanistically what's going on. Um, uh, um, and and uh, the fact that we, we still don't know a lot about just what the patterns are in the real ocean. Um, so I think um, large scale surveys are still really important just to give us information about how the actual ocean um, is, uh, the actual real uh, current day ocean is structured um, because we can't even really say for sure what the sort of distributions of diatoms are. We don't, we don't have that much knowledge. Um, I, I showed um, uh, earlier on in the slides of sort of synthesis of where we thought different phytoplankton lived. Um, and that was all the observations as they diatoms or coccolithophores or diazotrophs. And I don't know if you remember, but that figure was quite blank. Um, it was, there we go, Oops, there we go. Um, you know, we, we still don't really have a good map of what the biogeography of different species are in, this, in, in the real ocean. So um, we still need some of this big picture, um, but then we also need to know the sort of physiological reasons of why different things will respond um, to, to different stresses. Thank you very much. Um, I have one last question. I think we should be moving to the discussion. Um, I was particularly intrigued by the model where you mentioned that th there is going to be more stratification. We predict a little bit more stratification. And I was thinking if we can sort of predict where the hotspots of biodiversity would be in the future. If we have more stratification, I presume less mixing, so less gene flow between the organisms. So can we sort of predict where biodiversity Will uh, will be high. And we can we predict where in the current ocean we know where biodiversity is highest? Um, I think that might and, and Pedro might be a really good person to <laughs> to pull into that discussion. Um, I still think there's there is there is some uh, ambiguity as to what we call hotspots, um, and it depends how we define diversity as well. Um, um, so I think we still need to understand in our current ocean what sets patterns of, of uh, uh, diversity. And again, depending on, on exactly what your definition of diversity is. Um, if we know that, then yes, I think we can make predictions for the future where things become more stratified or not. Does that, how does that affect it? Um, but I, I think we're maybe in more fundamental, needing, needing to know our, our current ocean more. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. And remember that we will meet at uh, four thirty. Uh, thank you, Stephanie. Very nice talk. Great. I'll, I'll be back soon. Thank you.